off again. It is this is about noon on the 30th of May. So that was about uh, 12 hours into the day. Uh, did the full liturgy this morning. That's the full uh, meditation. Uh, watched a little Libra, a little of Lyle, uh, Lyle, Lionel Lebron. I re regularly watch him. He is, uh, uh, he, he, there's a, there's a significant amount to him, and, and, and in terms of others, in terms of why I watch him other, as compared to others, is that he's well placed. And so he gets a lot of things right that don't necessarily make the news. So if you want to find out some sort of tidbits, of information, sort of have an independent confirmation on things you may have already known. Well, uh, he's the person to to listen to. But unfortunately, he is also a lawyer and he's an intellectual, and this is where a large chunk of the problem is. You have to sort of sit through a person who's lecturing you uh, about different things. And then one of the terms he sticks on is this whole term pedophile. And the thing is, the problem with the term pedophile is that it, it's a modern problem that where the pedophile is no longer considered to be a criminal offense. It, it, it's no longer simply representative of those who not only are sexually attracted, but who actually attack children. They separated the words. So that pedophile is no longer a criminal offense. It is now a psychiatric disorder. It's a, it's a mental disorder. <laughs> And it causes, the so-called causes problems because it's a legal issue now. It's no longer an issue of my morality. This is, and this is where the problem is. He talks about morality, the morality of, of attacking children, the, the, the predation of children. But at the same time, he still argues within the whole context of moral theory and moral relativity. And the problem there is that just because you define something as moral does not mean that somebody else defines that same thing as moral as, moral as, as well. In other words, there is a separation between what, what, what one person considers moral and, and what another, another person considers moral. That is moral relativity. And you could not go out and say, okay, what you did was wrong, but what I did was right. So because this is what you do. But yet, this is exactly what we see. We see this sort of whole thing of moral relativity uh, being used by Lionel, but at the same time arguing about the dangers to children. And I think he doesn't bring up that the, the biggest dangers to children, if you look at how these attacks occur, do not come by strangers. The greatest dangers to children is in, in terms of sexual assault come from within within the family, with, 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 within their intimate circle. It's, it's, it's typically somebody they know. This is even true when you have uh, predators, when they're picking up people. The question is, is that the first the question is, do they know the person? That's the first question. And you check the people within the circle, within the family circle, this includes friends of the family, to see if their baby is a suspect because Primarily, that's where your suspect is going to be. But the process that, that Lionel has gone into completely ignores this. So yes, he's digging up his, his wife's cause of protecting children. But at the same time, he ignores some pretty significant factors. I mean, today, and during current time, a majority of the pedophiles, a majority of you recruiting into, let's say, child pornography and, and more about, you know, child trafficking, comes from the schools. The, 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 kids, the, the kids are recruited right within their school settings. 
and it's often done by teachers and people and other kids that they know. They're friends. Their friends may have an uncle who is uh, so and so active in pimping and prostitution, and will introduce the guy, the girl, to a life, uh, you know, because the, the, the friend, the, uh, the, uh, the, the the uncle's niece, who is a girl, a friend of the girl that's being recruited. They become good friends, they go for a sleepover, and they slowly but surely, the, 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 the friend is introduced to uh, uh, sexuality, introduced to uh, the life of prostitution. And the thing is, it, it, it's not done right away, there's, there's a grooming process. The thing is, now, that grooming process, if you, if you sit down and look at the grooming process for uh, uh, prostitution, it's well within the school system. The whole so-called health program is nothing more than a grooming process. And this is done by, by teachers, it's done by the government. And it's well known if you look at Paul Epstein, that you have a, a, a large chunk of your recruiting is also within the government. That they are significant. In the trafficking of children. So the thing is, you have to you have to not just consider one factor, but you have to consider all the factors. But he doesn't do that. And it's interesting the term pedophile doesn't actually come from the Greek because it's it's some like term he calls pederasty. But I'll give you the. Uh, the term in Greek later on. This we have to be a little, at a little later time because I do have to do more research on how the word changed from pederasty to pedophile. Uh, but there was a shift between uh, the Greek and the Latin, and the Latin, which is you know French, German, English, and so on and so forth, uh, all emerged with the term pedophile. <laughs> When you get into the legal sense of things, so you start defining things. And then, if you look at any legal textbook or any uh, sort of legal briefing type of thing, the first thing you'll see in any legal file or a legal brief is a list of terms and how they're defined. So, semantics and in, 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 in legality is very important. You know, when you say something, what do you mean by what you say? And uh, lawyers tend to spell things out uh, quite explicitly. They don't leave things uh, to a, uh, if you call, uh, the chance. They want to spell everything out. But the thing is, it's not always possible to spell everything out. And so what happens, but again, these are the people who can't see the forest or the trees. They only see the trees. So that uh, you know, a general term like like pedophilia goes lost I mean, is, is lost on the lawyer. So they go, whoa, whoa, what specifically do you mean by that? And they'll never figure it out. And this is the way Lionel is. He, he, he's just intellectual. And then the lawyers are typically intellectual. They're from that class of an intellectual who. Their world is about pretense, it's about the appearance of status. And when a person is so, so focused on that, they're not really going to focus on much anything else.
and then, this is where you look at you look at the things like Pride and Prejudice. Go to Brick Box, there's a lot of shows about the 1800s and the early 1900s. And that's where you'll find a, a large amount of your information. That's sort of examples. And you also steal, you'll also, you'll also see the behavior. Because there's a behavior with this as well. It's not simply uh, the presentation, that there, but there's a behavior that goes along with this. And you'll find that Blind LeBron actually fits a large chunk of the behavior. So he's an interesting character to watch. Uh, any observation does take a long time. I've been watching uh, Lyle now for close to well, more than four years. Uh, I watched him when he was uh, first covering the, covering the 2016 election, and then uh, realized that he was a Democrat who didn't necessarily agree with, it, with the Democratic line. So I continue to follow him. Watch him move from the Democratic left to the Republican right. And now he's he's somewhat meandering. His his his, his views on morality are changing. You see that he is conflicted with things. And so what happens is that's the thing you want to see if someone has the ability to be conflicted with a particular emotion. And he is. So that's a good thing. <sighs> To not be conflicted means you really don't have any sense of compassion for others. But he does, and he, but also at the same time, he's got a uh, significant amount of anger and a significant amount of pride. And so he, you watch as he evolves through these particular times and periods, the various emotions that he goes through and the things that he struggles with. So there is, there's, there's a lot more to his, uh, his live broadcast than you would, would imagine. It's about uh, a little after 7.30 in the evening. So, uh, that would be 17.30, between 17.30 and 17.45, uh, 17 hours and 45 minutes a day. outside. It's still a very nice day. Could have had a lot of sun. Ironically, he fits in pretty well with some of the topics 
uh, that are doing the deep dive research, uh, including fitting in with uh, uh, the uh, personality types like Voltaire. So when you talk about Voltaire, you can actually talk about Lionel LeBron. Because they're all intellectuals. And there is a similarity in thought. But of course, we were now interrupted by uh, crossing the street, taking our left turn. With a bus coming. Clear on the right, but we have a bus on there. So let's see, do we have it? Yep, we're fine. A little bit of a stall on the throttle, but anyways. As I said, what happens is that Lionel LeBron, because of where he's placed in terms of society, he's not getting, he's not at the top, but he's that he's sufficiently placed that there he has a good read on what's going on in the upper levels of society. This does not, not mean he knows everything. It just simply means that there's a good read there. So whether you like his opinion or not, it's something you have to take into account. And the thing is, is that the way he comes to his conclusions one can also see a lot of Voltaire there, and that Voltaire, in many situations, places himself, uh, well, much like Lionel Lebron, is about going to these social events, uh, these speaking engagements that he does, these the road tours, and this sort of shores up his fame, or should say his notoriety. And not a right, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, it's not, but it doesn't have to be good either. It can be kind of somewhat neutral. And this is sort of the same thing, is he's, 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 he's sort of, if you will, in some cases, wetting the ground to talk about things that, uh, that aren't necessarily being talked about. But the thing is, he needs to get deeper in, in terms of morality, and, and sort of debunk the whole concept of moral, rel moral relativity. And this whole con and the thing, is that, but it, see, getting into moral relativity well, and talking about uh, what's right for some and is not right for others, well, that's Voltaire. Voltaire brought forward a lot of a, a large chunk of what is called hedonism. That's moral theory. They've given it different terms over the different years, just like you know, like pedophilia is no longer pedophilia. It's now something else and. It depends on how you're going to court, and he says, well, you can't say that because of the conspiracy theorists and Pizzagate. I think that the people who talk about Pizzagate, they were kind of right. It was kind of, this is the way most conspiracy theorists think. And as they, 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 they see something... They see something, maybe the tip of the iceberg, and they think it's the whole thing. So in other words, the conspiracy theorist only sees maybe 10% of what's actually going on, and then draws their conclusions based on those, that 10%. Uh, a researcher spends a lot longer going into the deeper dive, but then again, how many people are going to sort of quit their jobs and do research for the rest of their lives, particularly as being independent. If you go on, if you go like you start doing like a large chunk of these uh, documentarians do, I think this whole channel to do these uh, documentaries, like Woody Harrelson narrates a number of these doc, uh, narrates a number of these documentaries. Yeah, I've seen on uh, Instagram, being advertised on Instagram. 
they're basically hatchet jobs. They're there. They're there primarily to please their funders. And that's about it. So what happens, you know the movie is going to be heavily biased. And once you've done enough for the research, you can drop biased work, because you know exactly what they're going to say. I think there's no way to correct it, because they're not going to take a, a, a cut in their paycheck to do so. So another thing that you can ask yourself the question now, when you're talking about research or whatever it is, who's paying them? Because no, well, I wouldn't say no. I would say I would say very few scientists today are truly independent of their funders. Most pander to the lowest common denominator. Most pander for their living. Most will adjust their statistics, their their reports, create called forward-looking reports, so that they'll make their funders happy and they'll be able to keep their jobs. This is the situation that's going on right now. And then you'll, get a, you'll get a bit of a feel for this if you watch the observations, the observation blog. Uh, because you see, it, it, it takes a long time to do any form of observation. There's a lot of sitting around doing nothing. Because, particularly if you're talking about climate, or what I call atmospheric physics, and that's what it really is, uh, to get one cycle of observation, you're talking about an entire year, 12 months. So you've got to repeat a good enough where you start looking at a trend. Well, a trend is five years, particularly in the, in the financial markets. So use that as a sort of a benchmark. Also, you now you're talking. If you want five cycles, you're getting five cycles. You're getting five years, five years worth of observation. Take that even further and say, no, oh, you want a ten-year benchmark. This is where you're getting into the, the, the to, to the the Gaussian curve uh, and Gaussian mathematics, Gaussian error uh, analysis. Uh, that's a whole other topic there. Uh, you're talking. You're talking a decade. How many people are willing to sit outside night after night, day after day, watching the clouds, seeing how they match up with what's going on with the satellites? Because there are a lot of different ways of configuring the satellite images. There's a lot of different uh, 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 views, not just one. How do you match up what is significant, what is not significant, particularly from what your, op from what your observations are showing? And again, that's a long period of time, 10 years to do that. And so this is something that most people don't do. To understand what's going on with CBD or, or any of the pandemic stuff, you have to know not only virology, you need to know uh, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and you also need to know organic chemistry. Because all these three, 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 three things are intertwined. But just because you know these things doesn't necessarily mean you know everything. That's not, these things give you an entrance to this. You're simply entering that sphere of knowledge. Was it simply about entering that sphere? There would be no more research. We say, okay, we're done. We know, we know everything. Pack everything up, and let's go home. But the thing is, in terms of research, it doesn't give you the answer. There isn't sort of no finite knowledge on things. And this is what was shown with, with the whole CBD thing. It, it was expected to be one thing because of the gain of function. And then it turned out to be something else completely. The the whole concept of gain of function didn't properly work, and so you ended up with a 
basically something less than the comical.